Hey guys, this is Justine Mara Anderson, or Barefoot Justine, depending on how you think of me. And that's me in my studio. It's a sequential artist workshop, which is where I'm at right now. If I were live, I'd be waving at you, and you'd basically be seeing that wall behind me. But as it is, a still photo will do. So, hello, and we're going to move on to details that work and details that don't, and why. And primarily, the why is about clarity. Without clarity, details just become more visual pollution, more line pollution, more rendering pollution. Why does this happen? Well, what's really happening a lot is artists are, have become very incestuous. A lot of young artists are only looking at deviant art. They're only looking at other young artists. And what they're looking at is young artists who, based on other young artists, on other young artists, because very incestuous. Young artists these days are not really looking at masters as much as they used to be. This is really sad because of the access of deviant art and all that stuff. Kind of turn that crap off if you can. Start looking for masters. I want to talk about why that's important as we go on. I think it will become very obvious to you why you need to be looking at masters and not other young artists. So, to start with, I'm basically going to break down several images. I'm going to show them to you in flashes. I'm going to tell you, what did you see? right? Now this is not a test of your visual acuity. If you didn't see it very clearly, that is not your feeling. That is the failing of the artist, okay? So don't be feel bad if this doesn't make sense to you when you look at something because it's saying about you, okay? This is about somebody failing to communicate to you, okay? Some of these will be very clear because they were done by masters. Others of them will be lousy because they're probably done by lousy, modern, young comic artists who you should not be paying attention to. So, when I say now, try not to blink. So here comes the first image. Are you ready? Here it comes. What did you see? Probably not much. The next image I'm going to put up for the same amount of time, but I bet you'll see a lot more. Here it comes. Yeah, granted, it was bigger, but still it was clear. What did you see? Okay, another one. Here it comes now. What did you see? Most people make out a bit of that one, but not enough. Okay, another one. Here it comes now. Very quick. All these are being held up for the same amount of time, but I bet you got that one almost entirely. So here comes another one. Now. Okay, not that one, but the one before it. Anyway. So let's go back and talk about why some of these registered with you immediately and why other ones probably did not. All right, the first thing is that everything in this image is really the same size and the same shape, okay? There's almost no negative space between this really unplanned, half-ass white wedges over here, which say nothing about negative shape, right? And then down here, even the black spaces down here, just turn into a muddle. There's no clarity here, none whatsoever. These blacks do not add anything to the understanding of the drawing and, in fact, obscure things. This obscures the main action. The fact that there's no black here outlining these claws completely obscures the claws. And this brings us to another entirely different but enormous problem with this drawing, with a lot of modern drawings of kids who are just looking at kids who are looking at kids, okay? These claws are the same size and shape as all of these claw-shaped objects in these over here. Therefore, they do not pop. They're just laying there in this freaking mess of ugly garbage that means nothing. Now, garbage can be beautifully drawn. Don't get me wrong. It's not about the garbage. It's about how poorly arranged the garbage is. We're going to talk about garbage later as well. So this brings us to another problem, which is every damn thing in this drawing is the same size. It's the same shape. These are all the same sizes and all the same shapes. There is nothing to get your eye, you know? It's just a jumble of same shapes same contrast, contrast against contrast in the wrong places, unplanned. This is just a terrible drawing. Nothing works. This is all the same as this, is all the same as this. This is all the same as this, is all the same as this. This is the same as this. Everything down here is the same as everything else on him. Nothing pops. Nothing is organized. Nothing has been carefully thought through. This drawing is complete failure, and I even talked about the stupid head and the adolescent fantasies about what men's arms should look like. Boy, you know, ladies, you think we've got it tough with the way uh, men draw us. Look at the way men draw men. It's just as horrific. 
Okay, this is the one that works. Now, it's no less detailed, but this is a drawing from a great master, Virgil Finlay, did fantastic pop stuff, mainly in the 30s, into the 40s and 50s and whatnot. Okay, why does this one work? Because it does everything the other drawing doesn't do. The drawing is extremely well organized. All the details in the background are grayed out, so they push backwards. It's roughly the same contrast level back here, and it's roughly the same shapes and sizes, right? Look here, we have white against gray. Here we have black against white. That's why that pops. Over here, white against gray. Here we have white against a much darker gray and a much, much larger area of white against much, much larger areas of darkness, okay? So contrast is partly why these things are popping and why they're recognizable. Look at this black head of hair against all this gray and against all the white right here. It really makes him pop. And then you've got this vertical, which creates a pattern, and this white, which separates this pattern from this pattern. Patterning will recede largely, and that's what's happening here. The, all the fabric is rendered in a pattern-like, similar way, whereas all of this fabric is rendered like fabric with bold lines, heavy lines, whites and darks. And then we've got this wonderful shape down here. This one doesn't work either. You know, it's by one of the so-called greats, Todd McFarlane of the 90s, who really helped pollute a lot of young minds with how art should look. Everything is the same damn shape and size. It's totally unreadable. The spotting of blacks adds nothing. It just distracts us throughout the entire composition. This is all the same size, all the same size, all the same size, all the same size, all the same size. I don't even know what's going on. Is the Hulk standing on the ground and Spider-Man is punching him from the side? Is Spider-Man standing on the ground and punching the Hulk into the air? I don't really know and I don't really care. Okay, this is Frank Frazetta. It's no less detailed, but the details are more well organized. This water is like to like. It all becomes a pattern. The clouds are like to like. It all becomes a pattern. Same up here except for this. But our details are focused. Focused right in here. We're going to talk a lot about that in these upcoming uh, discussions about Frank Frazetta and Bernie Wrightson, but that will be in the next week. But I think what you can see here happening is that these, these details are organized. They're placed to create flow. They're placed in a hierarchy. No organization. Organization. No organization. You want to organize your details so that they lead the eye through, and so that they're areas of rest, and so that the areas you really want to sink your teeth into, you can really sink your teeth into without being distracted by a whole bunch of tiny crap around here that doesn't need to be there. Good Lord, everything about this drawing is lousy. It's supposed to have some um, horizontals in it, so as, not horizontals, I'm sorry, diagonals in it, so as to make it more dynamic. But the diagonals are lame, and the diagonals repeat, and things are hard to read. This arm, and this comes right out of the shoulder. It's a disaster, which meets this elbow, which meets this shoulder. Three major elements are meeting right here. That's a mess. I didn't even notice till now this woman's head is on top, a hand is on top of this head. It's that bad, and I've been looking at this image for years. This and this, it's all the same. This and this, it's all the same. This thigh goes into this thigh. Everything is the same damn thing. Look at this. It looks just like thighs. Look at this. It looks just like thighs. There's nothing different going on here. This drawing is a failure. Oh, good Lord. I taught this drawing for many years, right? And it, it took two to three years before I realized that this guy has four arms. That should have been abundantly clear right away. Now, let's also move on to the fact that look at all this jumble of crap. It's all the same size, same size, same size. Everything's the same size. The negative space is polluted by unnecessary spattering. I know spattering is like all badass and everything, but it doesn't work if it doesn't work. It works when um, Ralph Steadman does it. He knows how to spatter. He's a master spatterer. The spotting of blacks is absolutely, completely meaningless. It just adds to the chaos. Spotting of blacks and the use of negative space should actually add to, not distract from, the clarity in an image. All right, let's talk about this and why it works. It works for a number of reasons. This foreground image, notice the contrast, white against black against gray. Very important. Now, what else is going on here? Very careful arrangement of elements. This is all like back here, like size, like shape. You know, everything's the like, like and value, right? So that remains in the middle ground there, this of course being the background. She pops because she suddenly breaks all the lounging 
like figures. Everything's the same size and shape back here. In this case, that's good because it's supposed to pop. If everything throughout the image were like that, like in the lousy drawings before, this image would fall apart. Okay, there are, so there's groupings of like objects here. There's groupings here. This is like one grouping of women. This is like another grouping, right? Then you've got her here and her here, right? Then you've got a grouping of small details here. So sometimes arranging your details and groupings can be very, very effective. Um, Paying attention to those groupings is very effective. Not only the groupings, but what do the groupings do? This is leading you to her, kind of to her butt crack in a way. This figure is leading you to her. These figures are leading you to her. And the angle of these figures is leading you to her. This breaks away from this grouping and leads you right into her arm and right into her lute. And this eye leads you into here as well, right? So our entire focus goes here, and then it sort of travels really elegantly through the space because the details are masterfully placed. They're masterfully thought through. This is a painting by Ang, I-N-G-R-E-S. Great stuff. I'm not going to talk about these at length, but these are pre-Raphaelite paintings by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Holman Hunt, uh, John William Waterhouse. I, you know, I'm not going to get specific about these. I'm going to blow through these really quickly. But what I want you to be thinking about is symbolism. And I'm just pointing you here to tell you that if you want to understand symbolism, start studying pre-Raphaelite paintings, the stories they come from, and writings on pre-Raphaelite paintings where they talk about the symbols. Because everything back here adds to your understanding of the mythology and of this character. Plus, look again though here, just quickly, pattern, big bold shapes. All this architectural stuff back here breaks down into little tiny wedges of similar value and creates a pattern. This yellow goes right through here. Notice this is all the same kind of red, but the main action is actually heightened by this little splash of yellow back here. With that splash of yellow down here, it would have become more confusing. It would have drawn too much attention to her dress here. This is how important composing the elements and the details are. This is a, a William Holman Hunt um, Piraphilite painting. Again, a lot of symbolism in here that you can look into yourself, right? But notice how there's everything back here becomes the same shape and size and the same contrast level, except for in the circular window area where it gets really bold and large in the circular window area here. Notice even this, even though this is similar in size, but definitely not in shape to this here, this is a lot lighter, right? And then we get to this beautiful lit up place down here. Another Pre-Raphaelite painting. Uh, a lot of symbolism going on in here. Um, you can study that on your own time. I just wanted to point you in this direction that that's another thing that details can do. Alright, details can add symbolism and symbols can add detail. This is one of my favorites to talk about when talking about details because it's such a complex little drawing. This is by Arthur Rackham, who's one of my very favorites, around 1909, 1910, 1911. That's when all of his stuff was kind of done, right? Okay, so back here, everything's about the same size and shape. That's intentional in this case. That creates a pattern that recedes. Even within that pattern that recedes, there are areas of clarity throughout all of it that really help the drawing. Okay, what else do it, does it do? This leads down here to this, which leads to these heads. This leads down to here, which leads to her head. Notice that even the background architecture does not interfere. It's not placed in an awkward place. This leads to her head. This leads from her head. Brings us back down to this bench here, which leads to the children, right? She's on an open area here. This is open. There's nothing awkward about the placement here. It looks very organic and natural. And you'll notice that the story, as we're coming down to her head, down to the children, down through here, across here, leads us to this empty space between their glances. What is this empty space? This is the naivete of the children and the rather horrible uh, things the witch wants to do to them, i.e. eat them, <laughs> cook them in the oven. So really, our focal point, while it is the figures, it's also the tension between the gaze, okay? Notice how dark he is and how gray this is i.e. that Virgil Finlay thing again. So this is just beautifully composed. More Arthur Rackham. Now, this is completely different. This is much more like a Where's Waldo sort of painting where everything is kind of a jumble, right? Now, if you look at this, you might be thinking, oh, well, it doesn't really work it's a jumble. Well, first of all, this one was intended by Rackham to be a jumble, but look more closely. What you begin to see is that these so-called jumbles are very carefully arranged, very artfully arranged. There are Groupings of activity, groupings of activity, groupings of activity, groupings of activity isolated in a sea of white. 
groupings of activity. Throughout this, there are small groupings of activity. So even this, which appears to be a bit of a jumble, is extremely well organized. This is fantastic too. Look at the groupings. Let's stay on the grouping thing. Get the groupings of her court back there. This grouping of the two fairies flying, right? The grouping of the court and her lady. This grouping of the court back here. Then back here we get this sort of pattern-like sense where all these trees and all these stars create the same size and shape. Look at how this pattern becomes like a mosaic. And while this much detail behind a head and hair could sometimes be dangerous, and you can sometimes lose the head in all this detail, this mosaic-like pattern actually recedes behind the head. So creating this pattern-like sense of like texture, like size, like shape is very effective when used by the right artist. Notice also the big open white space that leads you, leads you, leads you to her. They don't distract you from her. Everything here leads you to the image and once again that beautiful space between where the story is really beginning to form, right? Between her intention and his intention. This Rackhams is another brilliant example. This is from uh, The Ring of the Nibelung. Look at this like a grouping. These reeds are all grouped here. They're not scattered all throughout. They're just grouped in here. Now you can scatter them throughout, move them throughout, but be careful. Group them a little bit, okay? Another thing that's going on here is that Rackham has gotten very loose back here, very earthy, but on the main figure and on these women and on this, especially on the women in their hair. Everything gets very, very specific. Back here, it's tightly composed, but the lines are loosely applied. Notice this wonderful cradle effect the swinging cradle of these roots and how he cuts through that at this angle that just breaks that right away creates tension and then this creates another angle they're thrusting hands creating more tension and then look how intricate and fine the details here on the hair in the water i mean it's exquisite it's masterfully observed This one is uh, another Rackham, like that previous one, where when you look at it at first, it's a bit of a jumble. But this one, again, is the one you kind of explore room by room. And when you look at the rooms themselves, there's great clarity, a lot of details, a lot of details, but great clarity in what's going on. You know, this pattern right here, all behind them, recedes. And so the couple in their white gowns, they really, really pop. This bit of gray here really helps that chair, which is ahead of us in space, um, recede from us as far as the narrative content goes. These stairs lead to these guys. Everything kind of surrounds and frames these guys. Look how beautifully framed she is. This nice open area here, the bed here, you know, the pattern of the floorboards. Really terrific. Wow, this one just blows me away. This one's extremely difficult to understand for me. I could never imagine this heavy woodwork, the heavy line work, the heavy patterns, and yet our eye still goes right to this extremely delicate gesture. Well, why does that happen? How does it not become lost? Well, not sure I could reproduce it, but I can explain it, right? This table leads you to her. This leads you to her head. This leads you to her head. This comes down to her, and it all leads to this very delicate gesture in the weirdest little corner. I mean, I this is just an amazing drawing that that's able to, that, that all works as well as it does. Now, of course, everything's dark back here. Color helps a lot, but our eye is really, our eye is really being led not by color, but by composition. Now we're on to Virgil Finlay. Fabulous stuff, Virgil Finlay. Uh, pulp artist, 30s, 40s, maybe into the 50s, not 100% sure, but that's the era. Science fiction pulp magazines, right? You've got this wonderful amount of contrast, dark, very dark, against these beautiful bright highlights which are coming off of this area here. But our eye immediately goes right here, right to the tension between the four witches. You've got this great patterning around here, and then this fabulous white, which really illumines them, and then this wash of gray. Had this all been as detailed as all of this, this would have become a complete disaster. But Finley avoids that disaster by going ahead and evening out, turning it into a gray back there. This one is more about rendering details, right? It's not a lot of little bit of stuff in a room or anything like that. What you've got going on here instead are two dominant elements, and the details are in the rendering. The sort of veil over the skull is beautiful. Plus, this image is way ahead of its time. I mean, you could have seen this on it. 
death metal album cover or something, right? And Finlay probably did this in what the 30s or 40s or maybe the 50s or something like that. Probably, probably more like the 40s and 50s. I don't have my Finlay book with me. Look at this great detail in here. Uh, all this rendering in here is very like, right? It's very like, and then all this rendering that frames it is also very like but it's also very detailed and very textural. And then we go to the woman back here. So everything, every element pops accordingly. We talked about this one earlier, but I think you can start to see where Finlay is doing the same things over and over and over again. And that's the final Finlay. So I think that about covers our um, first lecture on details, on images that work and images that don't. Hopefully this gives you something to think about. And I'll see you real soon.